Welcome everyone to our program. My name is Beth Boyson. I'm a member of the library staff here at Bozeman Public Library. In celebration of the 22, 2022 One Book, One Bozeman selection, The Cold Millions by Jess Walter, Bozeman Public Library welcomes Mr. Rich Arstad to discuss the very long and robust organized labor union history in Montana. Mr. Arstad serves as a state archivist at the Montana Historical Society in Helena. His BA and MA in history from the University of Montana, longtime union membership and knowledge of local lore makes labor a favorite subject of his and promises an engaging presentation. Unions in the labor movement are a major plot point in the cold millions and feature real life rebel girl, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in this historical novel. Set in Spokane, Washington in 1909, this is a classic history of the modern American West. The Cold Millions is based on real life events and figures from the 1909-1910 free speech riots in Spokane, Washington, the author's hometown. Mr. Arstadt's discussion of organized labor in Montana is being recorded on Zoom and will be available on Pub Bozeman Public Library's YouTube page for viewing, along with several other One Book, One Bozeman programs, including a video on Elizabeth Gurley Flint. Bozeman Public Library would like to acknowledge our generous sponsor, Oracle, for their support of One Book, One Bozeman. Mr. Arstadt, welcome to the library. Thank you. This is uh, this is going to be a little different with uh, an audience in in person and an audience on Zoom. So um, I'll do the best I can. Uh, if you're having issues hearing or anything like that, um, shoot a message um, in the chat box, and we'll we'll make sure that we fix it. So when Beth asked me to uh, if I would be willing to come and talk about labor history in Montana, of course I said yes because it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, I wrote my master's thesis on a strike that happened in Lincoln County in 1917 during World War I. Um, and it was led by the industrial workers of the world. And I just happened to have a copy of the cold millions as well, which I was reading. So it all just kind of fell together. Um, in the time that we have this evening, however, I'm not going to be able to do the entire Montana labor movement because Montana's labor movement goes back to the territorial period. So what I decided to do was cover that earliest portion from the 1860s up to uh, about 1920, 1921. So it actually fits within the framework of the novel as well. And so that there'll be some overlap. Concentration is primarily on what occurred in Montana with the labor movement. Um, the industrial workers of the world and Gurley Flynn spent a considerable amount of time in Montana and when they were organizing the IWW. They came early, they came often, um, they, had a, they had more than a fair amount of success in organizing uh, um, the workers in Montana. Um, their primary focus for the IWW was, was organizing unskilled workers. And so that fit nicely with the mining communities as well as the timber communities as well, which most people aren't as familiar with. Um, the first strike to occur in Montana after the United States declared war and World War I actually did not happen in, in Butte. It happened in Eureka, Montana, up in the northwest corner of the state. That was the first place federal troops were stationed as well to break up the strike. So um, we'll hit on that a little bit as we, as we go along. As I mentioned, um, labor history in Montana goes back a long way. Um, the first union chartered in the state or in the territory of Montana was in 1866. Uh, it was the printers, um, members of the typographical union. Uh, they became typographical union number five, num, num, yeah, excuse me, number 95. Uh, and they represented the entire territory. Of course, the newspapers were primarily in Virginia City and Helena and Nevada City at the time. So that was their, that, that was their, their base of operations. Um, the first strike was the very next year in 1967, and you can see from the newspaper clippings and so forth where the printers are out on strike because the newspaper, the Herald, cut the uh, price on the number of words and so forth that they had to set per, per, per hour per day. And if you think about it, these typesetters are, are interesting individuals because when they're setting type, they're reading backwards and upside down as they're setting the type. So that's quite the skill level that they have by hand setting type um, for the printing industry. And they should have been paid 
you know, by the by the letter, obviously. Um, the interesting thing too about this is typographical union number 95 based out of Helena lasted until the 1970s when the union uh, merged with the Communication Workers of America. So they had been around for a, a long, long time from the territorial period to um, statehood and the new constitution in 1972. That DNA string of organized labor goes back uh, quite a ways. Of course, um, the place that gets the credit for organized labor in Montana is Butte. Um, Butte is that area that had the heaviest industry um, for the territory. And uh, so it seems logical that they would draw the largest crowd of, uh, of industrial workers um, into that area. In 1878, um, the Alice Gold Mining and Gold and Silver Mining Company and some others decided that they were going to cut the wages of the unskilled miners uh, on the hill. And they did, so the unskilled miners went out on strike. Um, in an unusual move, the skilled miners, um, and this is this is an era where skilled workers were seen as more as professionals. So for them to organize and have a union seemed to be more acceptable to companies than unskilled workers. Uh, so it was un unusual for skilled workers to support unskilled workers during this time period, um, but they did. And so the skilled miners and the unskilled miners went out on strike. The strike lasted, from what I've seen in the newspaper uh, articles, about, about two or three months before they actually settled. Um, they settled, they got the wages back for the unskilled workers, and a light bulb effect occurred, and the Butte miners realized that they were on to something here with this organizing. So they created the Butte Working Men's Association, which at first organized everybody. So you didn't just have to be a miner to belong to that. You could be the, you could be the grave digger, which I guess in some ways the grave digger is a miner too. I mean, he's digging holes in the ground. Or you could be somebody working in um, one of the retail stores in Butte. But 1878 kicks off unionism in Butte. And from there, it just kind of spreads out to the rest of the territory and the rest of the, the rest of the state. Um, unions initially in Montana had a great amount of success. Uh, in part because they were able to play Montana's copper kings off of one another. Marcus Daly, William Andrews Clark, um, each had a slice of the pie in Butte, and so the workers would work those three copper kings against one another to get benefits for workers. So Montana was one of the first places to get an eight-hour day for miners and smelter workers. One of the reasons they were able to do this is because Clark and Heinze got together and decided that they wanted to twist Marcus Daly's tail. And they knew that Daly didn't want the eight hour day. So they implemented the eight hour day in their minds and their smelter works, forcing Daly to do the same thing. So it's kind of interesting how they worked another and how it benefit, benefited labor. Montana was also one of the first states to adopt a labor day. Um, in the 1890s before it became a federal holiday and before a lot of the other states adopted it as well. Again, playing those two um, or those three individuals off of one another. By the 1890s, Butte miners were some of, if not the highest paid miners in the Rocky Mountain West. So if you wanted to make more than a living wage and have success uh, as a miner, you wanted to come to Butte and work in Butte. It was a closed shop. You didn't work on the hill unless you had a union card. And that spread out to other, um, that, uh, other businesses as well. So in 1893, you had the devaluation of silver and an economic depression that put a lot of people uh, out of work. And so 1893, 1894 was kind of a catalyst um, uh, time period. You also had a series of strikes in what they call the Coeur d'Alene's Mining District, which is that panhandle section of Idaho, uh, Kellogg, Mullen, Wallace, Burke, and through there. Those places, those mines were all organized as well. They had small independent unions, and they discovered quickly that the uh, National Mine Owners Association was able to uh, isolate those independent unions and break them one at a time. And so in 1893, the miners decided that they needed to get together and create one big umbrella organization to represent them all. 
And so they came to Butte in 1893 and organized the Western Federation of Miners. Uh, the Western Federation of Miners organized and Butte, the Butte Miners Union became local one of the, of the WFM. It was the cornerstone of the Western Federation of Miners, which again lasted well into the 20th century um, before merging with the U.S. Steelworkers in uh, 1968. So uh, they had a huge presence in, in, in Montana. Um, as I said, the 1890s were pretty, pretty rocky with the unemployment and so forth. And out in the West, there was a continuous migration of workers, typically single, white, male, um, who were looking for work, looking for a paycheck. It, there wasn't any such thing as, as uh, unemployment or anything like that. And so you worked a job until the job was over, and then you went on and found another job. So it wasn't unusual for workers to begin in the breadbasket of the United States to work the harvest and then travel westward um, by train, typically without paying, and work in the mines or the timber camps in western Montana, Idaho, Washington State, and then move to the Pacific Coast and do the fruit harvest, and then they would just do the loop again. Um, uh, to make a living. So in 1893, with the panic, uh, these individuals were out of work. Um, the number of mines that closed were pre was pretty astronomical. And a gentleman by the name of Jacob Coxey decided that um, one of the ways that the United States could deal with this unemployment was pass an infrastructure bill. And so he pushed for what he called a petition with boots on. And he urged unemployed workers to march to Washington, D.C. to ask Congress to pass an infrastructure bill to um, fix roads and build new roads and so forth. So it was a good roads bill. Um, Coxie was from Ohio. Um, he, I, I don't think he expected the movement to be as large as it became, um, but they had groups coming all the way from the Pacific Coast. They even had a group come from Montana itself a gentleman by the name of William Hogan was uh, leading a group of about 2,000 unemployed men um, who gathered in Butte in April of 1894. And they took possession of a Northern Pacific train in Butte. Took possession. They didn't steal it, they just borrowed it because they figured that it would, easier, it would be easier to get to Washington, D.C. by train than it would be to walk that entire train. So they borrowed the train in Butte and headed east. Um, when they did that, Governor Rickards of Montana um, contacted the President of the United States and said, you know, we've got an issue here in Montana with a runaway train headed to D.C., and we'd like the federal troops to stop them. So the President ordered troops from um, Fort Keogh in uh, near Miles City to intercept the train, and they stopped the train in uh, Forsyth, Montana, and arrested a number of the individuals from the train. The photographs are from the, his, uh, from the uh, collection at the Montana Historical uh, Society of L.A. Huffman, and they show that the, the train stopped in Forsyth in 1894, and of course you see the banner um, that they have, their Company 6 of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Coxey's Army. Um, so all of a sudden you've got 2,000 unemployed men who have no place to go, a bunch of them end up in Helena, Montana. Helena doesn't want to have anything to do with them. So the next best thing is to get them out of town. Well, how to get them out of town? You don't want to give them another train. So they sent them to Fort Benton. And they sent them to Fort Benton with enough money to buy lumber so that they could build boats and float down the Missouri River at least as far as St. Louis. And from St. Louis, which is a much shorter distance, walk. Uh, walk to Washington, D.C. I haven't been able to find ever if a boat made it from Fort Benton to St. Louis in 1894 with a contingent of these people. But it just, you, you get this vision of this big, great, the great group of individuals landing on the beach in, in St. Louis and getting off and, and having a debate if it's worth it to walk the rest of the way to D.C. You know, a, a large group of, of Coxey's army does make it to D.C. They do petition Congress for an infrastructure bill. Congress says no, uh, and that pretty much ends uh, that effort. It didn't end Coxey's effort. He ran for political office several times afterwards. He still continued to promote an infrastructure bill. And interesting enough, we still have huge political fights over infrastructure. We just 
don't want to fix roads and bridges and all that kind of good stuff, or at least we don't want to pay for it. So um, it's kind of interesting how things continue to cycle, cycle around. Um, 1894 was also uh, the big uh, Pullman um, railway, railway car strike in Chicago. Pullman made those fancy rail cars that were cheaper um, for the rich people to ride in when they were traveling long distances and so forth. Um, uh, Pullman Sr. had built a modern um, industrial community where the company furnished the housing, they had the store, they had the school, all that kind of stuff. He brought the workers in, they rented from him, they bought groceries from him, they sent their kids to his schools and so forth, and he paid them a fairly decent wage. As the Industrial Revolution rolled on, Pullman Jr., who took over the company from his father, realized that with mass production and assembly line work, interchangeable parts and things like that. He didn't need the craftsmen that he did in the past. So he slashed the wages of the workers. Well, he slashed the wages, but he didn't slash the rents or the groceries and so forth. So the Pullman workers went out on strike. They realized they didn't have enough power to get Pullman to come to the table and negotiate with them. So they convinced Eugene Debs and his American Railway Union to uh, assist them by boycotting uh, working on any train that had a Pullman car attached to it. So Debs was convinced that they could do that. Um, he sent out an order to all the American Railway Union chapters across the, the, the West and said, any car with a Pullman on it, we're not going to handle. Any car that doesn't have a Pullman on it, we'll take care of. The railroad barons got together and they decided that they were going to attach a Pullman car to every single train. And they attached it right behind the mail car. Because by doing that, by stopping and, and not working on the train and boycotting working on the train, they were interrupting the federal mail, which was a federal offense. So that allowed them to petition the president of the United States to again, use the military to break the strike and the boycott, which they did. And again, in the photograph here, you'll see a group of soldiers from Fort Keogh gathered at the rail yard in Billings, um, making sure that the workers can can work the trains and they're keeping the strikers back away from them. If you look closely in the photograph uh, on the right side, you'll see a lady about two thirds of the way down. Uh, that's Calamity Jane. Um, and again, this is one of L.A. Huffman's photographs uh, that, that uh, that's in the uh, collections of the Montana Historical Society. The boycott, of course, failed. Um, it also made the American Railway Union fail. Eugene Debs was sent to prison for the first of many times. Um, and Debs would switch from trying to organize workers to becoming uh, a member of the Socialist Party. And he ran for president of, of the United States a, a number of times on the socialist ticket. So uh, You'll see um, in the 1890s, a num the number of strikes that occurred in across the United States. And as a result of those strikes, you'll see the organization of, of, of labor, uh, the American Federation of Labor in 1886, the, the United Mine Workers in 1890, um, the Western Federation of Miners in 1893, the Montana Federation of Labor in 1894, uh, Teamsters, um, of course, the American Ra Railway Union only lasted a year before it was busted. Um, it became apparent to workers who were trying to organize that if the, if the US military got involved with whatever strike activity that they had going on, the strike was over because the workers just couldn't stand up to the US military. And so that ended things pretty quickly. And so industry, uh, um, industry tuned into that right away that that was the quickest way to end a strike was to figure out a, a, some way to to make the strike look like it was a a threat to national security or interstate commerce or, or something along those lines and the the, the uh, u.s military would get involved and the strike would end uh, in montana during the same time period you'll see the number of strikes that occurred between 1886 and 1894. And just look at the diversity of the strikes here. I mean, you've got hard rock miners, you've got coal miners, you've got granite cutters, you've got railway, uh, railroad workers, you've got uh, uh, retail clerks that are going out on strike and so forth. 
90% of the strikes or better were economic strikes. They were looking for higher wages. Um, in some instances in the mining industry and railroad and so forth, they were looking for safety um, um, concessions as well, but primarily they were looking for, for increases in, in, in wages. And uh, back in the day, um, industry was infamous for uh, when they hit upon hard economic times like they did in the 1890s, the first thing they did was cut wages. And so it made it very difficult for people to, to, uh, to make a living and extremely difficult for anybody that had a family. Um, craft unions, again, seem to have it in a little better if you were a member of the Carpenters Union or uh, one of the other crafts, uh, you seem to do a little better than the industrial workers. So in Montana, when the Western Federation of Miners was formed in 1893, and the Montana Federation of Labor was created a year later. Um, one of the things that Montana unions were interested in were assisting unskilled workers. So uh, the Montana Federation of Labor adopted a resolution for the creation of a federation to organize unskilled workers in the western portion of the United States. From that came the Western Labor Union in 1898. Um, and uh, so what you'll see up on the screen is the oldest union card that we have in the collections at the Montana Historical Society. It was issued in 1899 to L.P. Matson. It was the St. Regis uh, Lumberman's Union uh, of the Western Labor Union, which later on became the American Labor Union. And again, the primary goal of this group was to organize unskilled workers. Um, one of the first groups that they focused on were those individuals who were working in the timber industry, um, in part because the railroads and the Anaconda Company had subsidiary um, businesses that did those industries themselves. And so it was, it was kind of like an octopus organization. Um, the, the Anaconda Company and the railroads, they, they had a bite of everything, regardless of what type of industry it, it was. If it was coal mining, if it was hard rock mining, if it was railroads, if it was timber or whatever. So when they organized, they organized along those, they organized along those lines. Um, they uh, avoided any type of relationship or connection with the American Federation of Labor because they felt that the the National American Federation of Labor, which was being led by Samuel Gompers, was too conservative. Um, and Gompers and the AFL were not interested in organizing skilled or unskilled workers. They wanted to skip, they wanted to organize skilled workers only. So this left a void for, for them to, to, to work within. And so they concentrated on what was euphemistically called back in the day the bindle step worker that carried all his clothes and his bedding on his back from job to job. Uh, they lived in camps that were filthy, they carried bed dubs, they had lice, they didn't have washroom facilities for themselves, they didn't have laundries for their clothing, they had to provide their own bedding and so forth. And so that's what the American uh, Labor Union uh, focused on and it's what the IWW would focus on as well in, in the West when they were trying to organize that. As a matter of fact, they ALU kind of opened the door for the IWW to step in after its creation in 1905. And of course, the IWW was created in Chicago in 1905. Um, some of the uh, founding organizations of it were the Western Federation of Miners, uh, the Socialist Labor Party of America, the Socialist Party of America, any anarchist or, Mar or Marxist that happened to be in the area at the time that it was created. Um, some of the founding individuals were William Big Bill Haywood, uh, as well as Eugene Debs, um, Mother Jones, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, Lucy Parsons, whose husband had been executed for the Haymarket Square uh, massacre in 187 or 1886. Uh, and you can see from the preamble that unlike the American Federation of Labor, which pushed for a fair day's uh, wage for a fair day's labor, the IWW was interested in a class revolution. They wanted to overthrow the capitalist system and all the profit and so forth that was made by industry would go back to the workers. And so they were looking for an overthrow of the, of the capitalist system. Um, 
the IWW could never quite figure out exactly what it was and how it was going to do it. So they were constantly in a tug of war internally as well uh, amongst themselves, whether or not they were a revolution, a political party, a union, whatever. And so this led to what they called the overall brigade. Um, um, about 196, um, just before 196, 197, just before the, the free speech fights, where the overall brigade IWW members from the western portion of the United States went to the convention, the national convention in, in Chicago, and basically ousted the Socialist Party from the ranks of the IWW and installed uh, Big Bill Haywood as the uh, president of the organization. Um, about the time that the, uh, the uh, IWW uh, was created, former Idaho Governor Frank Stunenberg was assassinated. Um, a bomb was, was placed at his garden gate. He opened the gate, it exploded, he died. Um, later that day, uh, they arrested a gentleman by the name of Harry Orchard. That was his alias. His real name was Edward Albert Horsley. Um, he had been a member of the Western Federation of Miners and he was quick to finger Haywood and Charles Moyer and George Pettibone, who were the officers of the Western Federation of Miners, as the individuals who paid him to assassinate Stunenberg. Stunenberg had been governor of Idaho in the 1890s, late 1890s, um, during one of those periods of strikes in the Coeur d'Alene's and had called in federal troops to break the strike. So labor wasn't too happy uh, with him. Um, as a result of Harry Orchard's confession and, and, and uh, pointing out that uh, the leaders of the WFM were responsible for the assassination, um, private detectives kind of swooped down on the scene. Uh, you'll see an uh, image of uh, um, oh, James McParland. Um, James McParland was the head of Pinkerton in the Denver office. McParland had earned his spurs um, breaking the Molly Maguires in the anthracite coal region of Pennsylvania in the 1870s. And as a result of that, broke up that uh, union organization. By the 1890s, the Pinkerton Detective Agency had a larger group of strike breakers than the United States military had soldiers. Um, and that was their primary duty was to go around and break strike. So this was a prime opportunity for the Pinkerton Detective Agency, again, to get a slice of the pie, burnish their reputation as being able to handle labor issues um, for, for, for companies and so forth in, in, the, in the West. McParland creates a somewhat elaborate scheme where he kidnaps Moyer, Pettibone, and, and Haywood, secrets them onto a train, a special train that, uh, that they, they put together and transports them, extradites them to Idaho to stand trial. And so they arrive in Idaho to stand trial for the assassination of, uh, of uh, Stunenberg. Clarence Darrow, the famous attorney, shows up to defend, defend them. They put Haywood on trial first. And as you can see, he was found not guilty, as were the other two eventually. Um, Harry Orchard was sentenced to prison, and, uh, and I believe he died. Uh, in prison. So if you want to dive deeper into that story, there's a great book um, titled Big Trouble by J. Anthony Lucas that covers the whole thing. Uh, I will warn you, it is a doorstop. So it, 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 it's a heavy read, but it's interesting if you're, if you're into that. It was, it was quite the trial. It, of course, burnished the reputation of Clarence Darrow, but it also um, set the reputation um, for, I believe his name is Frank Bo uh, Bora who later became the U.S. Senator for, for Idaho. About the same time that the trial was going on in 1907, a telephone strike occurred in Montana that would have kind of long -reaching, um, um, a long-reaching impact. Alex Fairgrieve, who was the president of the Montana Federation at the, at the time, was organizing the telephone operators in Montana, and they, these ladies were called hello girls because they worked the switchboard and that's the that's what they said hello and then they would they would uh, transfer calls and so forth they went out on strike against the rocky mountain bell telephone company in 1907 for higher wages and a shorter work day 
Um, at the same time, they went out on strike. The uh, linemen for the telephone company who were represented by the International Brother, uh, Brotherhood of the Electrical Workers went out on strike too. At the same time, American labor union loggers and lumbermen along the Clark Fork and Bitterroot Rivers went on strike against the lumber company. So you have these three groups striking at the same time in, in, in Montana. Uh, Alex Fairgrieve, as president of the State Federation of Labor, realized that he had limited resources to help these groups during the strike period. And so he put all of his eggs in one basket and backed the telephone operator strike and essentially broke the bank of the, of, the, of the State Federation of Labor. However, the telephone operators did win their strike. Um, the interesting thing about that is they settled before the linemen settled their strike. And so when Fairgrieve came back and told them that they could go to work, um, they asked about the linemen strike that was going on at the same time. And Fairgrieve said, well, they're still out on strike. And the operators did something that was unusual for the time. They said, we're not going to go back to work until the strike is settled for the linemen as well. So again, you're starting to see that solidarity come together between um, organized labor in the, in the state of Montana, where they're really, really starting to help one another. You can see from the headlines and the newspapers and so forth that they're, that um, the telephone company is trying to get scabs to to uh, maintain their rail or their uh, telephone lines and so forth. They're hiring spies to infiltrate the union um, and, and all kinds of nefarious stuff. In the process, the labor movement in Montana took more of a step to, towards the center and affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. Um, in doing so, they backed off from supporting women's suffrage. Um, they backed off for some from supporting the referendum and initiative um, that they were trying to get passed in, in Montana, as well as the, the uh, direct election of uh, US senators and so forth. So it became more conservative and in line with industry um, after this 1907, 1908 uh, um, strike period. I threw this one in because I, I just thought it was interesting and it shows the diversity of the unions in, in Montana, the Retail Clerks Association, our protective union represented all the retail clerks in the state of Montana. Um, Hennessy was one of the big employers in Montana with a store in Butte and a store in Missoula. Um, most of the other retail businesses settled with the retail clerks, um, giving them uh, uh, shorter work days on holidays uh, so that they could have the holidays with their families and so forth. Hennessy held out and said that he wouldn't do that. And as a result, they went on strike against the Hennessy, uh, uh, the Hennessy stores in Butte and Missoula. Um, the union members for the retail clerks were just as salty as the miners and the loggers were. Um, they had no problem um, snatching somebody who was uh, crossing the picket line to work as a scab and escorting him down to the railroad uh, station and putting him on the next train out of town. Um, some of them were arrested and charged with kidnapping. It wasn't maybe technically kidnapping, but it, you know, it, it was a friendly warning that we're not going to abide this. The strike was eventually settled. Hennessy agreed to the shorter workday um, um, during the holidays and so forth. Uh, the support of the telephone workers left the logging um, local unions kind of without support. Uh, the other th interesting thing that happened is, is that the uh, lumbermen and loggers understood that without the support of the miners, there was no way that they could really be successful in their strike. So the Butte Miners Union, um, it, which by this time had become more conservative uh, uh, as well, decided that they weren't going to support um, the workers uh, that were working in the mills and the, in the logging camps and so forth that belonged to the Anaconda Company. And when they did that, the strike fell apart. Um, it also didn't help that the Montana Federation of Labor decided that they weren't going to assist them either. The interesting thing about this time period is that in 1907, the IWW successfully struck the Summer Lum Summers Lumber Company up uh, on Flathead Lake by Kalispell, getting wage increases for the workers there. So that kind of set the anchor for the IWW in Montana 
um, especially in the timber camps. And then, of course, we get to the rebel girl, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, 19 years old, pregnant, comes to Montana um, for the first free speech fight, which is in Missoula, uh, not Spokane. Um, and so uh, Missoula was almost like a test run for the IWW to challenge the city ordinance that said that they couldn't um, organize uh, or give organizing speeches on street corners in the city. Um, the IWW argued that if it was okay for uh, religious groups to do that and the Salvation Army and so forth, they should have the right to do that as well. They didn't really have a union hall. It was easier to catch workers on the street and talk to them about organizing and so forth. So Elizabeth Gurley Flynn led a free speech fight in Missoula uh, as kind of a tune-up for what was going to happen in Spokane and other places uh, to break the ordinance. And so she brought in other IWW members and loggers and anybody else that was displaced. Uh, they didn't have to preach unionism. They didn't talk socialism. They would stand on a box and they would read the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or a passage from the Bible, whatever they had at hand until um, the city police would arrest them. And the goal was to pack the city and county jail to the point that it broke the ordinance. And they did exactly that. This 19-year-old girl was successful in organizing that. She was arrested in Missoula, released, and she moved on to Spokane. Spokane was one of those great hubs where displaced workers had a tendency to gather to look for another job. Uh, there were uh, employment sharks working out of the Spokane area. They would charge a dollar uh, to a bindle stiff for a job. They would pay the dollar. They would go to the job, and they, there either wouldn't be a job, or the foreman would hire them, charge them a dollar, work them a week and fire them. And so it was just kind of this graph system that was going on. So the idea was to go to Spokane, have a free speech fight in Spokane as well, which the Cold Millions uh, covers. It's a great book, you should, you should read it. Um, but again, they broke, the ice in, they broke the ice in Montana. So um, that's Montana being seen on the, national, on the national level with their union organizing. And then we ratchet up a few years and, you know, sometimes you just have to blow it up. And so that's what the Butte Miners Union did in 1914. Um, they were to believe that the leadership of the union no longer represented them. Uh, they couldn't get the leadership to list, listen to them. So they stormed their own union hall, took the safe, and then dynamited it to the ground. Um, the Anaconda Company is not the Anaconda Company of old. Marcus Daly has been dead for a number of years. Uh, he sold the majority interest to the Anaconda Company to Standard Oil. A gentleman by the name of J.D. Ryan was running the Anaconda properties. Uh, it was consolidated. It was amalgamated. Um, and they had no interest whatsoever in dealing with the union. So by attacking their own union internally, uh, they broke the back of Butte Miners Union Local 1 in Butte. And even though they tried to form another union, it just didn't take a hold because the, the uh, company basically said, we're not going to recognize um, organized labor in, uh, in our mines uh, or smelters anymore. So we're, we're, we're done with that. We're done, we're done playing nice. Um, they attempted to organize. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't work. Um, there was some rioting and so forth in the streets. Uh, somebody dynamited one of the shacks uh, by the parrot mine, and as a result, the company requested troops be sent to Butte. And so in this case, uh, Governor Sam Stewart dispatched members of the Montana National Guard to Butte um, to implement martial law. And yes, that is a gallon gun. It's sitting in front of the courthouse in downtown Butte, uh, and Butte was under martial law Oof. at least a half a dozen times between 1914 and 1923, um, where the military would come in and they would clamp down on uh, strike activity, labor organizing, and so forth um, at, the, at the request of the company and the governor at the time. And so again, you'll see where uh, the Burns Detective Agency in this case is writing the Anaconda Company saying, hey, we hear you have a labor problem in Butte. We're more than happy to come down and help you break that group up. And, uh, and uh, there is evidence that um, 
the Anaconda Company used the Pinkerton Detective Agency a number of times, um, but I didn't find anything for Burns, so they must have uh, they must have turned them down. How are we doing on time? Okay, so um, another thing that occurred at about the same time that the Butte miners were rioting and blowing up their own union hall and so forth is a number of individuals who were working the harvest in South Dakota um, were card carrying members of the IWW. And they decided that they should travel to Butte to support the miners who were on strike. So taking a page out of the book of Coxey's army in the 1890s, they borrowed a train and headed to Montana. Um, across the High Line, uh, they got as far as Chelsea, Montana, uh, where, where they stopped. And while they were in Chelsea, uh, a gunfight broke out. Nobody knows who started what, but as a result of the gunfight, three individuals were killed. Um, one of the individuals who was, who was killed was uh, Albert Giant Valley, who was a civil engineer for the Great Northern Railroad. And so because of that, the sheriff of Sheridan County at that time um, had to basically go and investigate, uh, investigate the crime um, and see if he could sort things out and find out what was going on um, with this army of IWW who were marching into Montana because the Anaconda Company owned just about all the newspapers in, in the state at this time. And so they were writing these fake news <laughs> I mean, it's, it's exactly what it was. Fake news news articles about an army of 1,500 well-armed wobblies coming to Montana to take over the mines and overthrow the, the government of Montana and take over the state. So Governor Stewart is really concerned about what's going on because Butte is literally blowing up. And then he's got this, quote unquote, invading army coming along the high line. So he has to, he has to do something. The sheriff of Plentywood, um, the sheriff of uh, Sheridan County heads towards Chelsea, and he realizes about the time he gets to Poplar that he doesn't have a posse, so he needs to deputize some individuals. So Poplar is, of course, on the in, in reservation. Um, they're having their annual um, powwow, and so he deputizes a bunch of them. The interesting thing, as the newspaper article points out, is these gentlemen were all in full regalia for the powwow. So he goes, he deputizes them, they get on horseback, they ride across the prairie to, to Chelsea, Montana, and surround these wobblies. Now that had to have been one heck of a sight uh, for, this, for this to happen. The sheriff ends up uh, uh, detaining three individuals and takes them back to Plenty Wood to, uh, on potential charges for murder um, for the shootout. It turns out that um, some individuals on the train who weren't members of the IWW had decided that they were going to break into the Great Northern tool shed there and steal some stuff from it. And the leaders of the IWW group tried to break them up, and that's what started the, 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 the gunfight. So there were actually two members of the IWW that were killed and, and, and one other individual. The sheriff telegrams um, Governor Stewart and says, okay, situation's under control. Um, it wasn't 1,500. It was about 150. Not all of them were members of the IWW. The majority of them are harvest hands who were just returning home. So everything's good. Well, the governor's not really buying that completely. Neither are the residents of Glasgow, because like um, Hogan's army in Helena, all of a sudden you've got 100 or so men roaming around Glasgow who are unemployed and people are worried that they're gonna be looking for trouble and so forth. So the residents of Glasgow get together and they decide that they're going to solve their, their, their problem with the bindle stiffs. So they load them up in refrigerated cars with enough food and water to get them to the Pacific coast. And then they nailed the door shut and sent them west. And that's how they cleared out uh, the uh, bindle stiffs from the high line. Governor Stewart wired all the sheriffs in eastern Montana and said, you need to be on the lookout for the army of members. And most of the sheriff's offices responded back that there, there weren't an issue. It was mostly just individuals returning from the harvest and so forth. They were finding a few members of the IWW and when and where they could, they were confiscating firearms and so forth from these individuals. But it didn't look like an invading army. 
That didn't stop Governor Stewart from contacting President Woodrow Wilson and saying, I need federal troops in Missoula in case there's an insurrection in Montana. And Woodrow Wilson said, well, maybe, okay, we'll put a small contingent in Missoula, but I, I don't think you're gonna need it. But you can see how things are slowly escalating between the state government in Montana, the citizens and the workers and so forth as well. So when World War I comes around, the lid's really ready to blow off uh, the whole thing. And what starts it is when the IWW holds a convention in Spokane in March of 1917 and created the Industrial Workers uh, Union Number no. 500. It was organizing the individuals that worked in the timber industry and in the sawmills and so forth. Um, Governor Stewart was getting reports about this convention from the Montana um, um, Pine Manufacturers Association, um, who were getting reports from uh, an operative they had hired from the Teal Detective Agency to infiltrate the union. Um, a couple of things that this new union decided to do was they were going to strike the first company that was going to start operations in the spring of 19, or 1917. The other thing is, is that by 1917, the realization was is that the United States was not going to be able to avoid getting involved in the war in Europe any longer. And so the IWW didn't believe that that's a war that the workers should get involved in. That was a rich man's war, poor man's fight. They should concentrate on the class war. So they kicked around this notion of a resolution that if the United States declared war and implemented a draft, they would kick off a general strike across the nation. They would just all walk out to, to, to protest the draft. Um, the resolution wasn't adopted, but it was enough of a scare to really put them on the radar. Again, especially for Governor Stewart in, in Montana, because it just so happened that the first lumber company to go into operation in the spring of 1917 was the Eureka Lumber Company in Northwest Montana, when it hired its river drivers to bring their logs down the Tobacco River to the mill in Eureka. So when 75 of them walked out on strike in, in April of 1917, the manager, Charles Wheel of the, of the Eureka Lumber Company began hammering Governor Stewart with correspondence that they needed assistance to deal with these individuals. Two weeks after they went on on strike, Woodrow Wilson asked for a declaration of war against Germany and the United States gets into World War I. Um, because of that, because Eureka set astride the Great Northern's Transcontinental Railroad, federal troops were dispatched to Eureka to break strike, which they did. The interesting thing about this strike is it started in April of 1917 in Eureka, Montana, traveled down the Kootenai River to Libby, to Troy, into the Panhandle of Idaho, and then into eastern Washington and western Washington. And by August of 1917, there were about 25,000 loggers in the Pacific Northwest that were out on strike. Um, the numbers were so large that the U.S. was diverting military troops um, from duty overseas and sending them to the logging camps in Washington and Oregon and so forth because wood was considered an essential wartime material because they used it for that newfangled thing called an airplane and for building ships and, and so forth. So it became kind of a national security issue with the strike spreading throughout the entire Pacific Northwest. And again, it started, started in Montana. Um, we were the, we were the, we were the match that, uh, that lit the fire. The demands of the strikers were, were, were interesting. Um, they wanted sanitary sleeping conditions. Um, they wanted uh, spring beds um, that were made out of metal and so forth so that they wouldn't be um, homes to bed bugs and lice and so forth. Um, they wanted cabins for the workers in the woods to accommodate no more than 12 men instead of 25 to 30 um, with no window and no drying facility and so forth. Uh, they wanted a reading room and reading tables so that the men could read. They wanted decent food. They wanted um, a pay increase and they wanted an eight hour day. Nothing about a class revolution. Nothing about overthrowing the government. Just standard straight up union demands that you would see and that you had seen for 
decades prior to that. So pretty straightforward. Um, so this is going on in, in Northwestern Montana. Um, by June, they're down into Libya and in Detroit and, and, and headed west. Uh, in June of 1917, you have the Granite Mountain Speculator Mine Fire that killed 168 miners underground. Um, and the lid blows off of Butte again. Uh, just prior to that, um, however, the Irish in Butte staged a protest against uh, the draft in Butte. The Irish miners, of course, didn't want the United States to go to war on the side of Great Britain because they were all for an independent Ireland and Great Britain was occupying their homeland. So the last thing they wanted to do was to fight or do anything to assist Great Britain um, when their homeland was under, under British rule. So they, they had a protest of the draft in Butte and they had the speculator mine fire on June 8th. Like I said, they killed 168 miners. Um, because of the fire, because of some of the safety issues that they ran into, the miners tried to organize again into the Metal Mine Workers Union. Um, they petitioned uh, Jeanette Rankin, who was the representative uh, in the House of Representatives for Montana, um, to negotiate their demands with the company, um, the Anaconda Company under J.D. Ryan made it perfectly clear that the last thing that they wanted was Jeanette Rankin coming back to Montana to advocate for these miners. And I'm not sure she made it back to Montana before they had the situation uh, dealt with. So once again, um, Duke gets put under martial law. Late July, um, Frank Little comes back to Montana from the uh, uh, mines down in Bisbee, Arizona. He's a little roughed up. He's got a break, broken ankle that he got in a car crash. Uh, so when he gets off the train in Butte, he's on crutches and he's got a cast on his right ankle. Uh, he gives a few speeches in Butte. Um, one of them, uh, he refers to American soldiers as scabs, or at least that's what the newspaper um, reported. And uh, on August 1, and un unknown individuals are, arrive at his uh, boarding house, um, break into his room, uh, drag him out into the street, beat him up, throw him into the back of a Cadillac limousine, uh, drive a couple of blocks, stop, drag him out of the car, tie him to the bumper, and, and drag him to the edge of town and lynch him from a railroad trestle on the edge, on the edge of town. Um, Nobody is ever arrested or convicted for the crime. Uh, the interesting thing is that most of the eyewitnesses to it did identify a Cadillac limousine as the car that took him away. Um, I did some research for uh, the Dead in the West podcast who was researching Frank Little's murder and they wanted to know if we had vehicle registrations for Silverville County for that time period. And to let them know if I could find it, who the individuals were that owned Cadillacs, uh, limousines. I think there were three, four, but one of the individuals that owned a Cadillac limousine at that time was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Roy S. Alley, who was the strong man for uh, J.D. Ryan and the Anaconda Company. So maybe it was Ryan's uh, or Alley's uh, limousine that uh, Frank Little met his end in. Largest funeral procession in the history of Butte. Um, he's buried in the pauper section of the Mountain View Cemetery in Butte. Um, if you go there and stand at the foot of his grave and look up, you will also see the backside of the memorial that the North Butte Mining Company put up to those unidentified miners that died in the in the Granite Mountain Speculator Mine Fire. So it's 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 in some ways kind of a fitting resting place for Frank Little. Frank Little was, was kind of the troubleshooter for the IWW back in the day. Um, his great niece, great, great niece wrote a, a fantastic book about him and the rest of the Little family and their involvement with the IWW and the labor movement in the United States. So I would highly, highly recommend that. So by the 1920s, the labor movement and especially the IWW was limping along. In September of 1917, the federal government decided to step into the strike. And they went nationally raiding IWW halls and arresting the leadership. 
Um, they arrested several hundred individuals. Uh, they took him to Chicago and put him on trial for uh, sedition. Um, approximately 100 or better of them were convicted, uh, including Big Bill Haywood, who was sentenced to 20 years in Leavenworth. Haywood was out on bond and decided to skip off to Russia rather than go to Leavenworth. Um, but a number of individuals uh, did end up going to uh, Leavenworth and serving um, jail sentences anywhere from 20 to five years in the federal penitentiary for their strike activity during the war. The interesting thing about this is Woodrow Wilson sent his um, Secretary of Labor, whose last name was also Wilson, I think it's Wilson B. Wilson, um, West to investigate what was going on with the strikes in Montana and, and the Pacific Northwest and the timber industry and so forth. And Wilson came back and his report states matter of factly, that the reasons these individuals went on on strike were all legitimate. Cleaner working conditions, better food, better pay, shorter hours, all of it legitimate. What made the, sh the strikers vulnerable was the fact that they were organized under the IWW and the IWW was preaching class. So that had to be. Um, Governor Sam Stewart did the same thing, sent his commissioner of labor into Western Montana to figure out what was going on. His last name was Swindlehurst. He goes to Western Montana. He comes back and reports the same thing to Sam Stewart. Every reason that the, that the woods workers were out on strike were legitimate. The camps were terrible. The food was terrible. The pay was terrible. The hours long and dangerous and so forth. The only thing that gave cause for breaking the strike and arresting these individuals is the fact that they were organized in the So that's what they did. Montana ends up passing one of the stiffest, if not the stiffest uh, sedition law uh, in the country, implements it. Uh, over 100 individuals are arrested in the state of Montana for sedition, anything from having a beard too many in the two dot bar and mouthing off about the president or hoping that Germany wins the war or something like that. And they ended up finding themselves in a Montana state prison. So it's an interesting time period. By 1920, the IWW is just a shadow of itself in Montana, and they had one last gasp um, left in them in Butte uh, in April of 1920 when they decided to strike the Never Sweat Mine. Um, they go out on strike. Uh, their biggest claim to fame during this time period is they managed to shut down all the bars in Butte, which I think is probably a myth. Yeah, and I, I can't see him shutting down all the bars. Yeah, the strike doesn't last very long. Um, company immediately calls for uh, martial law. Uh, in the meantime, the miners march to the gate of the Never Sweat Mine where Roy Alley is at with a number of security personnel for the Anaconda Company. Um, somebody shouts, shoot, and they start shooting. Uh, a dozen or so miners were shot. According to reports, even from the company held newspapers was that they were all shot in the back. A gentleman by the name of Thomas Manning is the only fatality, and he died two or three days after being shot in the back from peritonitis, and they call it the Anaconda Road Massacre. And that kind of in, ended industrial unionism in Butte until the 1930s and the New Deal, um, when they when they reorganized and Montana again became and Butte again became a closed a closed shop. Um, power of the IWW is broken. Um, the organization still exists. Uh, and probably the one thing that they've done better than anything is promote their own history. Uh, and they do a fantastic job of that. So if you go to their website, which is www.iww.org, they actually have a history page that's phenomenal um, uh, to look at. So they're, they're great at, at, uh, at uh, promoting their own history. And as a matter of fact, they took a shot at organizing Starba uh, Starbucks in Seattle back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, didn't quite pull it off, but they were the first ones to take a stab at it. Unionism wasn't dead in Montana. Craft unions were still around, like the IBEW, like carpenters, plumbers, and pipe fitters, and so forth. But unions were also beginning to branch out into different locations. These are charters issued by the American Federation of Labor, which was created in 1916 one of them organizing a local at the University of Montana and the other one organizing a local at the great, at the great school of Missoula. The one at the University of Montana was created for the academic professors there. 
Um, one of the reasons that they organized was because in 1917, a professor by the name of Louis Levine was hired to come and work at the University of Montana. Uh, he was an economics professor. He was asked to do a report and paper on Montana's mining tax law, which he did. Um, and they told him that he could publish because it's academia. And if you're not published, you're, you're just done. And so he decides to publish the paper. The university's not real thrilled about it, but they let him do it. He publishes it. And essentially the paper says the Anaconda Company is not paying its fair share of tax. So the Anaconda Company makes a call to the president of the university and says, we don't like this guy. And they fire him. And the rest of the uh, professors formed a, a union at uh, the University of Montana. Um, so it's been around since 1919, 1920 uh, at, uh, at U of M. Uh, Mike Mansfield, uh, longtime uh, congressman from Montana, U.S. Senator, ambassador to China, was an officer in that local when he was teaching at the University of Montana as well. So it's got a long, rich history um, uh, in, the, in the state. And this is the first instance that a union steps into organizing the public sphere as opposed to the private sector in, in the state of Montana. So again, early, very early in the, in the, in the state. It's not the only attempt at organizing. Uh, right here in Bozeman at the Montana State University, the professors also formed a local uh, that lasted for a short period of time. Um, this is the charter for it. Uh, they organized for many of the same reasons um, at the time in the 1920s. Academic freedom was a big topic of conversation about what professors could, could teach, uh, what they could write, and, and so forth. So by having a union, they had some, some support, some protection from, from, uh, from, uh, from industry who didn't like the way uh, or what they were teaching. Uh, in the 1920s, American industry adopted what they called the American Plan, um, in which they would grant modest concessions for workers. Um, and they even created some company unions and so forth, supposedly to support the workers and, and, and so forth. But they still weren't, the workers still weren't organized. Um, they couldn't collectively bargain wages uh, or things like that. Strikes were a big no no. Um, as well. Um, and a good example of this is what the Montana um, um, Pine Manufacturers Association did in, uh, in Missoula in, in 1918 when they met. Uh, led by the Anaconda Company, um, they got together and they decided that they were going to clean up the camps and they were gonna provide better food and they were going to work with the Missoula County uh, library system to make sure that the men working in the lumber camps had better reading material. Because the IWW was infamous for their little pamphlets and so forth that they handed out that preached the class war and all of that kind of good stuff. One lumber operator put it, we're gonna figure out a way to feed these individuals better because when a man gets up from the breakfast table with the grouch on, he's no good for the rest of the day. So they basically spun the story that the demands that these guys made in 1917 and made it almost sound like the reasons for some of these conditions in the camps were the, were the fault of the men themselves, not the lumber operators. So it's interesting how they went to, um, how, how they spun the propaganda on that. I mean, they even had drawings of railroad, railway cars um, that they had set up for shower rooms and everything for these individuals. They were gonna hire, uh, they were going to consult with the home economics department at the University of Montana to come up with a menu so they could serve better food as well. So it was quite the change in, in uh, the situation for Montana. And Montana, like a lot of other places, um, unskilled workers would, be, would not be represented for a number of years until the election of FDR and the passage of the Wagner Act in the 1930s and so forth, when you've seen an explosion of organizing and so forth. But that's the next story um, down the line. But this kind of covers the time frame in Montana and union activity in Montana during, um, during the period that the cold millions uh, covers. And a lot of it, again, finds its root here in the state of Montana. Montana was a hotbed of labor organizing um, back in the day and still has a, a, a 
strong um, labor organization uh, in the state, um, strong enough that they were able to put down uh, four right to work bills in the 2021 um, state legislature, uh, which is pretty impressive. So um, that's Montana labor history from 1866 to 1920-ish. Questions? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the secondary title, but the, the main title was just Frank Little. And then it, it was about the rest of the family that was involved in the IWW as well. He had a brother and a sister that were also members of the IWW. But she also talks about how his murder and their kind of harassment because of Frank Little's activities and so forth really shut the family down. And, and so Frank's narrative was not something that was shared um, even within the confines of the family. It's a great book. Um, you know, they, they set him up pretty nicely. I mean, the Russian Revolution is going on. I, he, he didn't starve, but he ended up dying there and was buried in Red Square. So, um, Gurley Flynn had a falling out with Haywood, uh, I believe shortly after the free speech fight in Spokane and left the IWW. And then she was one of the founding members of the ACLU. Um, she was also a member of the Communist Party in the United States um, and uh, um, never gave up her rebel spirit. Um, I believe she remained married to uh, Jack Jones. Um, they had uh, three kids, two boys and one girl. And she died in the 1960s. She had a pretty full, pretty full life. Yeah, that really tarnished Haywood's reputation, him skipping off to Russia to avoid his prison sentence. Um, even though the sentence was pretty stiff, uh, he wasn't the only one to get a 20 year sentence. Most of them didn't serve out the entire time, um, but it was still it was still pretty harsh. Um, at least two of the individuals, Don Sheridan and Olin B. Anderson were Montanans who helped organize that Northwest corner of the state. They were, they were sentenced to Leavenworth as well. And at one time you could go to the Leavenworth uh, the state or the federal penitentiary's website through the National Archives there in Kansas and uh, access a list of the famous prisoners that were held at, uh, at the federal penitentiary there. And they actually had photographs of all the IWW individuals that were convicted and, and sentenced to 11 more. That's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It was rough and rowdy. <laughs> no place for the weak. Anything else? I stunned him to silence. It's it's interesting. Um, like I said, Montana's labor history is is phenomenal. I did that. I I've been working on this timeline for a decade, putting bits and pieces together as I find it. Um, the Historical Society has a number of labor union collections um, in the archives and so forth. And, and you know, we occasionally still get some in. Um, I just am I'm processing a, uh, a fairly large collection for the hod carriers out of Missoula. And I was going through that and processing it. I found a minute book for the bartenders union in Kalispell from 1938 to 1950. So um, we even got a, a, a collection of several union um, locals from here in the Bozeman area, the bartenders union, uh, the grain millers union, um, the Teamsters local. Uh, so Bozeman was, was, uh, was uh, organized at one time uh, as well. Oh, 
Oh, he's talking about there's every kind of Bolshevik, Reds, agitators, or disorganizers of our labor or business. So basically, uh, Uncle Sam is upset because, because of all the labor rabble rousers and so, so forth around. The 1920s was the first Red Scare in the U.S. as well. Um, it was also when the anarchists decided they were going to send out a number of letter bombs, and one of them to the Attorney General of the United States at the time, um, A. Palmer Mitchell, uh, which killed one of his uh, servants that worked for him and, and so forth. It, that, and he hired a young man in the Justice Department to take on these anarchists. Uh, his name was Jed Hoover. And so that's how Hoover got his start in the Department of Justice, which led to the FBI. And essentially what they did was they were just rounding up anarchists and socialists and communists. And if they loved communism so much, then they could get on the ship and they would send them to Russia. And they actually sent one boatload to Russia before the US courts got involved and said, yeah, you know, you, you, there's this thing called due process that, that you have to uh, follow. So you can't, you can't do that anymore. But it was, it was really the, the, the beginning of the, of the Red Scare in, in the United States. And then of course you had the big coal strikes in West Virginia and Kentucky and, and Pennsylvania and so forth in the 1920s as well. Um, we're all familiar with the term redneck. Um, redneck didn't come from somebody from the backwoods or something like that. Rednecks were actually those individuals who were members of the United Mine Workers that were also communists and they were called rednecks because they wore a red bandana around their neck. There's a great movie um, called Mate Wan. Mate Wan. M-A-T-E-W-A-N takes place in West Virginia um, about a coal strike in the 1920s. Um, it's based on a true story um, and they talk about that as well. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of strike activity going on um, through that World War I period into, into the 1920s. <laughs> Not normal, right? I mean, that's what most everybody remembers, you know, Sally Fields on the sign up says union. No? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wrong demographic. Wrong, wrong. <laughs> wrong age group. Okay. Well, May Wong's really outside your age group. Um, oh, yeah. You can. It, it, it's a great movie. Thank you. Oh, yeah. You even let me go over time. We will be ending this meeting for all. Have a good night.